Hello you guys and welcome back to my channel. I know that it's been a hot minute so if you don't know, hello, my name is Christina, I'm 24 and I live with a number of various chronic illnesses. My main diagnosis being Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Been about a year since I uploaded last so needless to say you guys were a little bit worried and you want to know what happened to the vlogs. I was still on Instagram, you can still find me on Facebook. I just have not been able to come on here and edit a video. It was never supposed to be this long. It was always supposed to be like this temporary thing where it's like, oh, I'll just do it next week and catch them up and then next week turned into next month and then months turned into yeah i just felt like i had to make this video because i didn't want to go back and just confuse everybody with that but then i didn't want to like just start over and start uploading from now without acknowledging this entire year that just happened to me it wouldn't make any sense believe me a lot has gone on <laughs> So, I just wanted to make a video, a little chat to update you guys on what's really happened. We'll get there, but if you haven't noticed, I've put on a lot of weight. Not like fat weight, it's like swelling weight. And this is because my lymphatic system is under a lot of stress, and so I have something called lymphedema. I was supposed to have my first therapy session today where they basically like massage you to squeeze out all of like the fluid and they wrap you up like a mummy so it doesn't come back. That didn't happen because coronavirus. If there's a ton of jump cuts or you see me like glancing away it's because I had to go through an entire year and write down basically what happened month by month. I have a lot of amnesia. I don't remember most of this year. So I had to kind of piece it together between what my family's told me and journal entries and pictures and videos I'm finding on my phone and my camera. So <laughs> I got it all written down here. There's a few reasons why I haven't really been uploading. First of all, I mean, I was just too sick. I <laughs> spent a lot of the year in the hospital. The time that I spent out of the hospital I don't really remember very well because I was so medicated or in so much pain or just having trauma episodes, which is the next reason why I haven't really been uploading. I've been diagnosed with PTSD um, from medical trauma. I have a mental health professional, <laughs> so I am not just like self-diagnosing myself. Although, I mean, I kind of knew that's what my diagnosis would end up being anyway. But um, I have been actually going through a lot of flashbacks and there's a lot of things that trigger me, like different like sounds and smells and anything that really reminds me of the hospital. Sometimes I'll just go into these flashbacks where, for instance, our fire alarm was going off and the beeping started to remind me of the operating room in the ICU and I couldn't get it to stop and I started to freak out and basically I go into these like trances where it's like I'm not here, I'm back in the hospital or back wherever I was and it's like it's not even a memory it's like I'm there again and nothing can really pull me out of it my parents say it's just kind of like I start like crying and screaming and shaking it also has given me a lot of night terrors and something called sleep paralysis which is kind of like lucid dreaming but like not fun but anyway it's just made it a little bit difficult to edit because going through the footage keeps setting off my anxiety and my PTSD which hasn't been fun and it has made this quite a long process. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't do it. I don't want you guys to feel like I'm doing this just because of you because I'm definitely 
doing this because I feel like I am ready and I think it's good for me to go through this footage and to face some of these things head on that maybe I forgot or maybe I want to forget but it has been hard and it has impacted my editing schedule so apologize but not really because I don't really want to apologize for my mental health I can't control it and I'm a big believer in mental health being treated equally with physical health I think health is health and when you need to take care of your mind and your brain then you need to take care of your mind and your brain just the way that you would take care of any other part of your body <laughs> so sorry I'm not sorry and finally actually a lot of hospitals have a policy against filming and that's really frustrating but I understand why you can kind of get around it by like filming little clips on your phone or whatever of yourself if you're by yourself but really just they want to protect everybody's personal health information so if you got like somebody in the background of your vlog or something like that and you're like exposing them I don't know HIPAA laws and whatever so I spent a lot of time in the hospital and therefore I spent a lot of time that I couldn't really film it is what it is. This intro is getting pretty long, so I think I should just get into the video. I have a feeling this video is going to be pretty long, too, and I'm already out of tea. Last time I checked in with you guys, let's see, my last vlog, I think I was in the second week of a two-week intensive physical therapy session. We were staying down as a family in Rhode Island. I was getting my body better from a bout of sepsis and then a collapsed lung and chest tube. You can actually go back and watch that. <laughs> There's actually video footage of that one. But I was doing that. My sister was also doing physical therapy with me because she was gearing up to go into tethered cord surgery. So her spinal cord was tethered to the inside of her spinal column. This is something that I've had happen to me as well. And this was her first like big surgery and so she was gearing up for that I think I was just starting to eat again after about three and a half years on a feeding tube and so that was super exciting and I'm still eating my sister's surgery went pretty fantastically she was a champ I'm sure that she'll want to come on here and tell you about her experience so I'll just leave that up to her so the couple months after my last vlog I would say were probably some of the best months that I've had since becoming like a chronically ill human being. I got the chance to have a little bit of independence that I have never had in my 24 years because I've just been too sick. I got to spend some time with friends who came to visit. I definitely have some footage of that. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. Hopefully I can insert some of it here because we kind of had a blast. I have continued on my journey with food. I have been adding more and more foods and I am loving it. I have discovered a passion for cooking and it has not slowed down since then. I absolutely love it. So for those glorious few months, I was doing pretty well, but around like March, April, I really started to feel things unraveling again. I just had this horrible, horrible pain in my lower back, more on my left side. So I would go to like step down on my left leg and it just would not take my weight. It was like, I would scream out in pain and collapse. I, I could not control it. I live in pretty severe chronic daily pain. And so I know the difference between like, ow, I overdid it, I'm sore, I have like a small injury and like something's really wrong. And this was one of those like something's really wrong situations. There's pain you can push through and then there's pain that your body just physically will not let you push through and this was one of those times. So I had to start using a cane and really could barely walk. <laughs> But I would walk for short distances. If we had to do any kind of long distance, I would be in my wheelchair. You can't really see, but 
I'm in a wheelchair. <laughs> so the pain just kept getting worse. I went to my pain doctor and he did some injections. He did some injections into the nerves, into the muscles. Then I went back and he did some steroid injections into my SI joints. That helped for a little while. It really didn't last. So we ultimately decided to go and see a doctor in Pennsylvania who was a neuroradiologist and had a history in chiropractic work. We had heard that he was doing work with EDS patients and really worked on that like mind-body connection. It was an out-of-pocket thing. Luckily, a family member of ours set up a GoFundMe page for my family and we were able to raise the money to go see this doctor. So my sister and I piled in the car with my mom and off we went to Lancaster, Pennsylvania where I think we did about a week of intensive appointments with him every single day for like five hours a day. And he was able to really help me a lot with some tricks on walking and vision and controlling my dysautonomia, which all rocks. And he sent me home with a bag of tricks and some home exercises to do, which I still use every single day and I still find very helpful. My sister also found him really helpful. It was a good experience overall for both of us, although he did do some imaging for her that brought back some news that we weren't exactly ready to hear, but I think we kind of knew it was coming anyway. Again, I think I might let her tell you guys about that herself. But even after this trip and this wonderful treatment, I pretty much knew that I was bound for some kind of surgery. I could not handle the pain at all. It was just getting to be too much and I was having a lot more neurological symptoms. Should have probably seen my doctor back then, but we had a really special trip planned in May. I was lucky enough to go on another little beach retreat for EDS families and it was just exactly what our family needed at the time and I'm so glad that I was able to push through and have a good time. I will absolutely treasure those memories for the rest of my life. I think my family got the chance to be the family that we've been like robbed of being for all of these years. We've just been like ships passing in the night and we've kind of had to turn into two teens and just we haven't been a family and I have a lot of you guys reach out to me and say oh my gosh your family's so great like your, your support system is so wonderful and the truth is it's just like we've all been in survival mode for years and oftentimes it's really hard for us especially having to cohabitate in such a small small house this house is really small we're in New England housing prices are expensive so Getting to go on that trip was so important for us. I just think about it every single day when I'm having a hard time. Hamilton! That was the end of May and right after that, I believe like on the way home, I picked up my new TMJ splint, I had some sleep studies done and then we finally made it home home for just a tiny while until I found myself completely unable to walk, completely incontinent and totally just not with it neurologically at all. I was having issues with what we thought might be mini strokes as I've had in the past. But anyway, I found myself in the Rhode Island hospital emergency room because that is where my physical therapist told me to go. And I had some scans done and was diagnosed with tethered cord. <laughs> Again! 
I had already had it twice. My sister just had surgery for it, so I was like, great. I was at the same hospital that she had her surgery, and a couple days later, I had my third tethered cord release. And I had a little bit of a different experience than my sister had. I had the surgery, and when I woke up, I was in the ICU with the intubation tube still down my throat and my hands were strained out of reach of the call bell. So I had no idea where I was, no idea what had happened, why I was like this. My mom was not allowed in the room. The room that I was sharing with an old man next to me who was actively dying with his whole family around him and I was just behind a curtain in the back trying not to choke to death on my own bloody vomit. Oh and I should probably say the reason that I was intubated still was because during surgery they had a hard time getting the breathing tube, the intubation tube down and so they caused a lot of damage while they were trying to get it down which caused a lot of swelling and she was afraid that if they took the tube out and then something went wrong and I was swelling and I couldn't breathe that they would have to do a trach which is when they have to kind of cut through the trachea from the front and stick a tube in there and no one wants that as their first choice so I appreciate that. I just wish that there had been better communication, better everything afterwards. It just wasn't handled well. It just wasn't handled well and if they had handled it differently I would have had a much different experience. I try to be a very understanding patient but just a really ridiculous situation. Needless to say this was not a fun experience for me. I was in a ton of pain. I was unable to communicate that. I really wanted to see my mom. I was unable to communicate that. Apparently she had been there at the very beginning. She kind of had snuck in to bring our stuff in but then they kicked her out again. But my mom had given me a notebook so that I could try to talk to everybody but they took it away and they were so rude. <laughs> Apparently I was supposed to be sedated and not remember any of this but the sedation totally failed because here I am. I want to make a whole story time video on this because apparently we still have that notebook and I would like to see what I wrote in it because I was not a happy camper. Let me tell you something about me. I do not like to be restrained. I am super good. I'm a good patient. I promise I'm great. But if you tie my arms down, I freak the heck out. The way that I like to calm my anxiety is like touching my face because the first thing that kind of happens when I go into like a panic attack is that my face goes numb and I think that's common like your lips go tingly and stuff like that so like it's like a grounding technique for me to like know that I'm still alive that I can like feel my face so if you tie me down I'm not a happy camper at all and I also <laughs> to not have nice nurses at all. They talked about me like I was not there the entire time. I was intubated for like two days because basically from what I gleaned from listening in on their conversations, they could not get a hold of the doctor who was supposed to take the tube out. So they just had to leave it in for like two days. I was like that and I was kind of fighting the tube a little bit because I didn't need it anymore but they just couldn't get anybody who could come and take it out and I have TMJ so having this like giant thing in my mouth wasn't really comfortable and so the lady kept coming and like screaming at me for biting down on the tube like meanwhile I'm literally choking and she was like Ugh, do you need me to like suction you out? And I'm like, why are you like, uh, yeah, could you? Thanks. Like, isn't this your job? Why did you sign up for this job if you don't want to do it? So she was really rude. And because it was like July, there were tons of med students there who had just kind of become doctors. And so like, 
I was just listening in on their conversations because I had nothing better to do. But they'd be like talking about me straight up right in front of me like I wasn't there. <laughs> they'd come over to me like, don't worry, I'm gonna get the tube out in five minutes. And then I'd watch them like give me more of the sedative, like the verse that, and I'd be like, ah, she won't remember any of this, don't worry. The real kicker was when they did finally come to extubate me. I don't know how much you know about tethered cord surgery, but you're supposed to lie flat for three days after, and I was supposed to lie flat for a little bit longer than that because I had had the surgery a few times, and I really was at a high risk for a leak. My dura, like the lining around your spinal cord, it's like really, really thin, and she had to put a patch in and stuff like that, so we had to be careful. I had no idea how long I had been in the ICU because no one would sting and tell me any information. Uh, so I was kind of concerned that they were sitting me up too soon. They weren't concerned whatsoever. So they come in and I was pretty much just like screaming at them, but you can't do that with a tube in your throat. So I was just kind of like angrily thrashing against my arm holder things. So they weren't super happy with that, but you know what? I wasn't super happy either, so I get really sassy when I talk about this because it was just not a great experience. But they went from like totally flat to sitting me up like 90 degrees in like, like a second, like one push of the button. And it was quite jarring and it was extremely painful. And as soon as they sat me up, I just like felt my spine collapse. Like the entire weight of my body just collapsed in on itself. And I was just like kind of screaming against my restraints. And in that moment, I knew like this surgery was not gonna fix the problem that I was having. But once the tube was out, I was able to take a few steps without peeing myself completely so that was exciting and positive and enough to get me out of the hospital. I went home and pretty much don't remember anything for the next couple months. I just know that I needed to make it through my uncle's wedding. My uncle was scheduled to get married in September and I was not going to miss it. I wanted to wear my sari, I wanted to see my family, I was not going to miss it, and I did not. I made it through the wedding in September. That was so special. I absolutely loved it. We had so much fun, loved seeing my family, loved meeting my new Indian family, and then pretty much like just a few days after that we drove down to my doctor, expecting that it was going to just be a small surgery, if anything, with that maybe I would need my remaining one little area of my spine fused and then I'd be golden. Well, wasn't quite how it happened. We looked at the imaging and it was pretty shocking, although I guess it shouldn't have been. <laughs> that the x-rays that were taken the day before I had had my tethered cord surgery in Rhode Island versus the day after were quite starkly different. The one before surgery, I had absolutely zero range of motion in my lumbar spine. And the day after I had, I believe it was like over 22 degrees of improper motion, like past what a normal person should have, so like 22 degrees past normal. Numbers don't really matter, I guess, and I was pretty out of it at that point. So unfortunately, instead of having a one level spinal fusion, I had to have 19 levels done, and it was a rough one. <laughs> it was really rough. Um, I woke up, I had sustained some nerve damage in my leg and in my arm, which made it really hard to move around, especially since I was in so much pain. And I had lost a lot of blood, so I needed a few blood transfusions, but then I had a really bad adverse reaction. We don't know if it was like a mast cell allergic thing or if it was some weird body response to the 
transfusions so I ended up having like seizures and then I had a lot of issues with my cortisol and my adrenals crashing it was just like a really rough recovery oh and also I saved the best for last I was allergic to the pillow they used in the operating room like really allergic when I say allergic I mean my entire face peeled off with chemical burns and blisters from lying on the pillow for 11 hours during surgery so you can see my chin is now really scarred and it was just down to like tissue and blisters it was really disgusting got to find out what's in that pillow the company has not called us back they think we're gonna sue them. I don't know, my dad wants to sue them and I just wanna figure out what the heck is in that pillow so I don't accidentally like, buy something with that in there. But yeah, so I have this nice scar and I don't know, you can't really even see how bad it is because I have like a good light on. But let me see if I like turn off the lighting if you can get a better view. I put makeup over it so like the idea was that you wouldn't be able to see it but it's actually pretty bad and I'm probably gonna have to go to like a plastic surgeon or something like that to get it looked at or a dermatologist I don't know it's like on the back burner list I'm not gonna lie it's kind of difficult when you're having like mental health issues your whole body is swelling up and then like you have this giant scar on your face hello like can me say self-esteem issues but I gotta say I'm super thankful for that surgery I was doing really amazing after actually like I walked pretty much like the next day I wanted out I wanted to get back to where we were staying I didn't want to stay in the hospital and they were like all right I mean you've done this before and I was doing great I went to my follow-up appointment and as we were getting back to the place we were staying, after the follow-up appointment, you know that feeling you get when you remember like something really cringy that you did as a kid? I'm getting that feeling right now. <laughs> okay. So I went to go in the house and I like stepped up on the first step and my mom was like, wait, like I don't have the door unlocked yet. Like don't get on the stairs. So I was like, okay, I won't. So I went to like step backwards down off the stairs. And like meanwhile, I'm in this like full body brace. The brace went from like my butt hip area all the way up and then into a neck brace and then had like a head strap. So it really like limited my ability to move and I wasn't used to the weight of it. So when I went to step back, like I just fell back completely straight onto my brand new fusion onto the concrete and then my head hit really hard on the grass behind it <laughs> talk about like the worst thing you could do definitely i'm gonna be like reliving that for the rest of my life <laughs> we call the emts i'm crying because i feel so bad because i just messed up like everything and some random landscaping guy comes running over from like the yard next door and is like let's get her up like let's sit her up and just get her walking and i'm like don't you dare touch me i just had surgery i don't know if i broke anything and if i did it could kill me if it moves so <laughs> no we are not going to sit up the EMTs came. I'm just still sobbing like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do this. I'm probably fine. Like, there was no reason to call you guys. I just wanted to be safe. And I remember, like, the EMT looked me straight in the eye and was like, I have been working this job for, like, six years. And this is probably the most legitimate call that I've ever received. And I honestly don't know if that made me feel better or worse. So then, of course, I went to the ER got some scans done in the brace my hip was super sore but they were saying you know you landed pretty hard on it you probably bruised it i was like yeah i probably did scans came back they said everything looked great nothing looked broken everything was a-okay i was good to go brushed the leaves out of my hair was getting ready to get out of there 
and they came in and wanted to give me a little bit of pain medication which I didn't really ask for but I wasn't really turning down either since my hip was just really killing me and so the lady comes and she's like messing around with my port to give me the IV medication because for whatever reason they only do IV meds in the ER which makes no sense to me so she starts messing around with my port and then she goes oh I forgot something I'll be right back and I think she was just grabbing some vials to take some blood, but she went out, opened the curtain with her gloves on, went, got the vials, came back, closed the curtain with her gloves still on, and then comes back and starts messing with my port again. And I was like, you need to change your gloves. Like, you just left the room. And she was like, oh, no, I didn't touch anything besides the vials. It's okay. Like, it's totally sterile. And I'm like, no, I just saw you touch that curtain. And she just was not listening to me. She just starts fiddling around. Meanwhile, I was in so much pain, I just passed out. So I just, I couldn't advocate anymore for myself. But I remember that like sinking feeling in my stomach right before I went out of like, I'm gonna get an infection. Sure enough, three days later, ambulance is back. Christina is getting loaded back in the ambulance. They had to carry me down the stairs in a tarp. <laughs> Because I could not move. I was so sick and I still had this horrible pain in my hip. I hadn't been able to move since I had fallen three days before. It is nighttime on Halloween. It is pouring rain. The tarp very quickly turned into like a pool. They're slipping and sliding everywhere. I'm slipping and sliding in and out of consciousness. It was crazy. They get me to the hospital. It was obvious that I had sepsis. They started me on broad spectrum antibiotics before the cultures even came back. And I had some more x-rays done on my hip and it turns out that they missed the fact that I had a fracture in my pelvis. Well, actually, okay. It's called a pubic ramus fracture, superior pubic ramus fracture. And it was a stable fracture, so it didn't need surgery. Like It was just kind of like a crack, I guess. Um, but I don't really like telling people that I broke my pubic bone, so I just tell people I broke my pelvis, which is technically true, but yeah, um, hey internet, I broke my pubic bone. So, cultures come back, I have two different infections, which are both septic, so they roll through my whole bloodstream and all my organs, I added an extra IV antibiotic that specially targeted that second bug that was a little bit harder to get rid of. And of course we had to run them through normal IVs because they had to take my port out of my chest because it was infected and it's really, really hard to totally eradicate an infection from inside of a port so they basically just take it out if you infect it. And oh my goodness, it was just a disaster of like, I have terrible veins and when you have sepsis, they are obviously, like I said, running IV antibiotics and fluids the whole time and blood transfusions and I had potassium issues. So we were running a lot of different things and my veins are terrible. So we had to keep putting in IVs all over the place and I kept blowing them. And then they had to like check your blood like a ton of times a day just to make sure that your blood levels are staying safe and so it was just like I did not have a single vein left like this is the only vein that was good was like the one on like the inside of like my pinky right here and yeah that was not cool <laughs> so yeah we ended up in the hospital for a little while doing those until my cultures officially came back clean which didn't mean that i could stop the iv antibiotics but it did mean that i was well enough to have another port put in so i did get a new port they put the new port in on the other side it's not the greatest port it's a little tiny it's really hard to access but it works and it's there and i'm thankful for it surgery for that went pretty well i had this awesome like lady boss doctor surgeon lady i mean she reminded me of the addison from Grey's anatomy my mom doesn't see it but i totally see it 
She was amazing. I loved her. She was a vascular surgeon. I actually still text her. She's really cool. But needless to say, this was a really difficult experience, especially because once I was able to get out of the hospital, I was still on IV antibiotics for quite a while, which meant that I had to run them. And that became kind of a full-time job, especially with all the other medications. I was just like in full-time med mode. It did not matter if it was the middle of the night or the daytime. It was around the clock and I was already so sick and exhausted. It was not an easy time. I really felt isolated and just, it was hard. It was right before Christmas. I wanted to be home. I wasn't well enough to travel home. So we were just staying in the hotel and I was completely non-weight bearing because of my pubic fracture. So I was totally wheelchair bound, which I'm used to now, but at first I really wasn't. And it was just hard, but we did end up making it home just a few days before Christmas very similar to the year before when I literally had almost the same experience with sepsis in that hospital after spinal surgery. Still working through that in trauma therapy. But we did make it home thanks to another wonderful giant hip immobilizing piece on my already crazy brace and the car air mattress that I found online and we were able to have Christmas together so that was beyond appreciated. Which kind of brings us to now. It's about March and progress has been really slow. Luckily, I've had my physical therapy. As you guys know by now, probably Trish, my physical therapist, is kind of my lifeline. If I didn't have her, I don't know what I would do. I'm still in extreme amounts of pain. My body is really struggling and suffering. I have sustained a brain injury. We don't really know if it's an accumulation of just a lot of things over the last couple of years or if it happened when I hit my head or if it was sepsis related. I am dealing with the swelling, as I mentioned. It seems to be some sort of lymphedema brought on by the sepsis. Um, so I am just really, really swollen all over my body. Uh, you could probably tell <laughs> I'm definitely not where I was before and I don't think that I was like a super healthy weight before I think I was really underweight for a while So it is good to see a little bit of something something on my body But this is definitely not my normal and this is definitely not like fat. It is straight-up fluid So we've been working really hard in physical therapy to get it down and we have and I've been working really hard at home to get it down and I have, I'm putting in like five hours a day of exercise on the exercise bike, on an arm bike. Um, I have those like leg squeezers from the hospital, those compression squeezers, I've been using those. I found them on Amazon and when I'm not using those I'm wearing compression garments and walking little bits with my walker when I can. But ultimately I mean for a power chair something that I never thought would be a tool that I needed which I guess is like how I feel about everything that I ended up with like the feeding tube and the port like it just never really crossed my mind that that would be something I would need but when I went in for my wheelchair repair I was put through to an OT and she evaluated me and said that I was much better qualified for a power chair than a manual chair especially because of my shoulders. They're constant dislocations and tears. So I've been actually trialing out a power chair. This year's just been a lot. And putting it 
like in a timeline like this is kind of difficult for me to be honest but it's also kind of cathartic because it's like oh this is everything that I've been through and this is where I am now it's hard to see progress sometimes when new things are constantly popping up and you feel just kind of stagnant in your recovery a few months ago I was not able to do the things that I'm able to do today so I'm thankful for that I do wonder if it would have been better if I had had the tethered cord surgery with the surgeon that I am used to seeing but really I didn't have that choice at the time because I wasn't able to travel I was in that ER and that's just how it all happened to go it's easy to want to blame the surgeon or the hospital it's easy to want to blame myself for falling it's easy to want to blame that nurse for giving me sepsis which I kind of do blame that nurse for giving me sepsis but at the end of the day, this is where I am now. And there's nothing that's going to change the past. But now it's up to me to change the future. So onward I go. I'm trying to get back to the things that I love. Back to my Etsy shop. Back to filming. And back to hopefully editing and uploading videos. It is a total bummer to have this coronavirus thing going on. Because number one, I have really bad lungs. They're really weak. And especially after that bout of sepsis, if I get sick right now... I don't have a whole lot of oomph to fight it off. So we're a little bit concerned about that. I'm not super concerned. Like I'm not stressing constantly about it. But it's definitely affecting my life more and more. Because it's just like another looming thing that's out of my control. And they had to cancel all of my appointments for the swelling and the lymphedema massage for the next like month or two which really stinks. I was really looking forward to depuffing, as I call it, getting all that fluid out of there so that my shunt can work better and I can have an appetite again. But I understand why social distancing is important. I definitely suggest social distancing. I just was really excited to start that treatment i had to pay for all of the wrappings out of my own pocket now i don't know if i'm going to get to use them so that really stinks they were like 200 dollars just for the stupid bandages because for whatever reason this is not covered i feel like it should be it's not but hey I'm thankful to be healthy, my healthy, right now. And there are a lot of people suffering out there, both with the physical illness and just the anxiety and panic surrounding it. So I'm really sorry if this is affecting you. I think it's affecting everyone at this point. Can't even find toilet paper that I'm not allergic to anymore. So <laughs> thanks, Corona. But basically, that's where I have been for the last year. Uh, <laughs> definitely leaving some stuff out but hey it is a year that is a lot to recap in a video and like I said I'm definitely going to go more specifically into some of these topics you guys will have to let me know what you want to see first if you want to see like a story time about my intubation experience or if you want to see old vlog footage or if you wanted to see like general silliness or talk with my sister I don't know just let me know what content like really helps you guys because that's what I'm here for I love you guys and I'm so glad to be back if you liked this video you can give it a thumbs up if you want to see more videos you can hit the subscribe button if you want to see when those videos go up then you can hit that little bell for the notifications and I will see you guys in my next video bye